South Florida. This is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Hi there and welcome to Headliners. I'm Lauren Pastrana. Lauder Hill officials and residents came together in hopes of reversing House Bill 543. That's the permitless carry law that was passed back in July. The meeting comes on the heels of several mass shootings across the country. CBS News Miami's Anna McAllister joins us from Lauder Hill City Hall with the latest. Those who live in Lauder Hill tell me that they're all too familiar with gun violence. We spoke to several women who tell us that their loved ones were shot and killed, and now they're demanding stricter gun laws. Resolution number 23R10283 is approved on a vote of five to zero. In a unanimous vote, Water Hill commissioners voted in favor of a resolution to try to reverse Florida House Bill 543, the law allowing permitless carry across the state. Right now, Florida ranks fourth in the nation in the highest number of mass shootings. That's an issue. And having this type of legislation where folks can really have permitless carry, I think, um, makes the situation worse. This issue hits close to home for the commissioners and many residents in Water Hill. They say the senseless gun violence continues to plague their community to be impacted by this. I never thought I would have seen this coming. Brittany Buckner is all too familiar with the heartache of losing a loved one to gun violence. She lost her only daughter, 19 year old Destiny in July, and her killer is still at large. I take it one day at a time. Um, I miss her. <laughs> I miss her TikToks. I miss her calling me. Um, it still feels like it's a nightmare, you know. Buckner and members of Water Hill Peace 365 and Leading Ladies, community advocacy groups attended Monday night's commission meeting. The group of activists, along with Commissioner Dunn, are working on a petition pushing for stricter gun laws. Every woman that is standing here has lost some family member to an act of violence, especially gun violence. And so it's imperative that we get as much signatures as we can and push to get 543 reversed. So far, Commissioner Dunn says they have about 700 signatures. She says the next thing to do is to send the resolution to the governor's office, to the legislature, and to other cities across the state in hopes of overturning permitless carry. For now, reporting in Lauder Hill, Anna McAllister, CBS News Miami. A Venezuelan American organization based in South Florida is asking Washington to once again place sanctions against the regime of Nicolas Maduro. The Venezuelan government voided the primaries where a woman was elected as the opposition leader. CBS News Miami's Ivan Taylor joins us from Doral with the details. The reaction of the Venezuelan community here in South Florida is the same. They are saying that the Biden administration trusted the regime of Nicolas Maduro and now Washington needs to act quickly. Maduro is getting more and more power every day. 56-year-old Maria Corina Machado, the opposition leader who said we will bury socialism in 2024, will not be authorized to run against Nicolás Maduro in next year's presidential elections, in spite of the fact that the Biden administration removed sanctions placed on Nicolás Maduro's regime. We are asking the government of President Biden to put again back the sanctions and do more sanctions. In Doral, the independent Venezuelan American citizens organization and other South Florida activists said the Biden administration trusted the Maduro regime about holding free elections. However, they said Maduro underestimated the primaries of the opposition. More than 2.4 million Venezuelans in the country and abroad voted. We elect Maria Corina Machado by 99%, 97% of the votes pro Maria Corina Machado. What happens? Comes Maduro's regime and wipes out completely the primaries. They say Caracas follows orders from Havana. The struggle for the freedom of Venezuela is the struggle for the freedom of Cuba. It's the same regime that is oppressing Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba. According to them, the economic and political crisis in Venezuela will continue, and thus, the migration. I think the weaker the United States is with Maduro, the more refugees you will have in the United States. 
According to U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, almost 335,000 Venezuelans entered illegally through the southern border in the fiscal year 2023, which ended in September. That same month, record figure of Venezuelans crossed the border, more than 73,000 only in September. Well, the presidential elections in Venezuela are scheduled for the last quarter of 2024. Nicolás Maduro seeks to be re-elected again. In Doral, Ivan Taylor, CBS News, Miami. We have new details on the status of the SkyTrain in Miami International Airport's Concourse D. It remained shut down after inspectors found cracks in three support columns. CBS News Miami's Ted Scouten shows us the new options for passengers to go from one end of the mile long concourse to the other. Some 60,000 passengers a day walk through MIA's busy Concourse D. It stretches a mile and a quarter, with the SkyTrain covering a mile of that. But for more than a month now, the train's been out of service. But I'm going now to D60, and I know I've been working for about 15, 15, 20 minutes. Eddie Jerez, like many passengers, finds himself walking more than he bargained for after seeing the signs that the SkyTrain is not running. But it's a lot. I'm glad I'm healthy, and I'm glad I had time. So I'm going to walk from gate D60 to gate D1. We'll see how long that takes. I walked the concourse at a comfortable pace. Well, it's been 12 minutes and 17 seconds. Still not there. I made it from one end to the other in just under 20 minutes. Well, I made it to D1. It took 18 minutes and 57 seconds and walking 1.25 miles. The SkyTrain shut down after an inspection, found three columns that support the train near Station 1 had cracks. System-wide, there are 100 columns. Back in mid-September, uh, three pier caps were, were discovered with cracks. So what we're doing is our engineering team is continuing an analysis of the entire system, of all the concrete structure in the system, just to make sure that the problem is isolated to those three pier caps. MIA Director Ralph Coutier hopes stations 2, 3, and 4 will be able to reopen if no cracks are found. In the meantime, two golf cart trolleys are moving passengers around with stops along the way. Six more will be added soon, as well as a shuttle that will go from one end to the other down on the tarmac. That trip will take five to eight minutes. We're also going to have in mid-November a shuttle bus service on the air side, which will transport passengers between gates D10 and D55. Passenger Diane Darling has some advice while all this is going on. Go with the flow, otherwise you shouldn't leave your house. <laughs> so as we said, help is on the way that increased trolley service as well as a bus service expected to begin in about two weeks, just in time for the holiday rush. At Miami International, Ted Scouten, CBS News, Miami. When we come back, if you're on the house hunt, we have what you need to know to get the best bang for your buck. Stay with us. South Florida. This is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back. I'm Lauren Pastrana. While interest rates are expected to stay put, rent and home prices continue to climb. So what should you do? CBS News Miami's Chelsea Jones reports that some figures are pointing to renting. An analysis done by Global Commercial Real Estate Services says it's 52% more expensive to buy a home right now, so renting might actually save you money. And one local prospective home buyer says trying to find that forever home is coming with some hurdles. Downtown Miami is home to high rises, and Samuel Tuckerman is a resident in one of them. I did grow up in Miami. Uh, I do love the city, and I want to live here, but it's challenging. He wants to buy as he continues to grow his family, and two years ago, he was well on his way. We found a pretty good opportunity in North Miami for like 280K, uh, unbelievable deal for a penthouse. But the deal went to someone else. The market was competitive, so instead of buying, he decided to rent. The Wall Street Journal cites an analysis done by Global Commercial Real Estate Services, or CBRE. They report the cost of buying a home is at its most extreme since 1996, citing the average new monthly mortgage payment is 52% higher than the average apartment rent. But local real estate expert Christopher Molina says there's more to consider. That might be correct in that small isolated area called New York. However, South Florida has many different market forces working in its benefit. In fact, homes have gone up 5% this year alone. He says tax write-offs, deductions, and home equity can help lower costs in the long run. He says ultimately, the time to buy is now. Now the market's settled. You can make more offers, you can make lower offers, and you can actually find the home that you love. 
yeah, it's going to have a higher rate, but you refinance later. But for people like Tuckerman, renting is the option right now. You know, the issue with these high interest rates, it makes it really challenging to commit to something, even though you could potentially refinance next year. So Melina says the inventory here in South Florida is limited and prices are likely not to drop. So his advice to first time home buyers is to look into some programs and then buy some property in Miami. I'm Chelsea Jones, CBS News, Miami. One invasive species is a lengthy problem in the Florida Everglades, and according to the U.S. Geological Survey, climate change is helping these predators spread farther north. CBS News Miami's Christian Benavides takes a, us on a python hunt. Here's how a typical night for Donna Khalil starts, and this... That is Ver Vermes python. ...is how it ends. Khalil is a python elimination specialist for the South Florida Water Management District. They're out here hunting, but you're out here hunting too. That's right, we're out here hunting the hunters. She is one of about 100 contractors in the Everglades looking for these large invasive snakes and getting paid for it. Earlier this year, hunters snagged a 19-foot Burmese python, the longest ever measured and documented in the state. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission estimates there are currently as many as 300,000 Burmese pythons in the Everglades, with no major predator besides humans. The Burmese python has taken a toll on native species. Raccoon and possum population in the park has dropped by 99%. Marsh and cottontail rabbits, along with foxes, have effectively disappeared. Khalil says alligators have fallen prey too. You grab it, curl around it, constrict it, and kill it. Once it's dead, it will swallow it whole. It all depends on who's the bigger uh, predator. That will decide who wins the uh, wins the battle. Woohoo! Florida has been hosting an annual Python Florida. challenge with thirty thousand dollars in prices as one way to combat the growing problem. Over the last two That's decades, nice eighteen thousand of these belly crawlers have been removed. Yeah. Just a fraction of the Python population. Cristian Benavides, CBS News, The Everglades. Plenty more where those came from. A South Florida staple is back open for business just in time for the holidays. We'll help you plan your visit to Nosberry Farm. From South Florida, this is Headliners, only on CBS News Miami. Welcome back, I'm Lauren Pastrana. One man's passion for art and philanthropy is making Miami proud. Sheldon Pally and his wife Myrna spent most of their 65 year marriage giving back to the local art scene. Sadly, Myrna recently died, but Sheldon is still committed to supporting our arts community. CBS News Miami's Lisa Petrillo has the inspiring story. So this is a diamond. Yes. Philanthropist Sheldon Pally's passion for the arts hasn't faded over the years. For more than half a century, Sheldon, a University of Miami graduate, and his late wife Myrna, also a UM alum, have been deeply involved with numerous South Florida arts organizations as founding members and benefactors. She was on the board, the beginning board of the New World School of the Arts, and was on the board until her passing in 2020. Some of the other arts organizations the Pallies helped establish and fund include the Miami Film Festival, the Coconut Grove Arts Festival, and the Education Fund. What was re really important is that this, when we came here in the early 50s, this was a very, very small southern town, uh, very one-sided and watched all these institutions like Young Arts and the Symphony and the Film Festival and the museums come and grow. And it's really been, it's really been a wonder. Sheldon's most passionate program is at the Low Art Museum on the University of Miami campus. Well, we have the Lubinsky over here. Since the 1970s, Myrna and Sheldon were studio art glass collectors. In 2007, they donated their collection of more than 300 pieces, which are housed in the Myrna and Sheldon Pally Pavilion for contemporary glass and studio arts at the Low Art Museum. Sheldon said they wanted to share with the community. We have enjoyed it through the years, and we would like everybody else to enjoy it as well to see what can be done with uh, uh, with glass as an art form. The Lowe Museum's art director, Jill Dupy, says the Pally's generosity has no limits. What impressed me so deeply was not only their commitment to glass, to the Lowe, 
to artists, but also to education, to to children and to students and to the community. Most recently, Sheldon donated to a new free exhibition at the Low titled Order Up, the Pop Art of John Miller, which includes 35 pieces of oversized 1950s style glass sculptures of food, drinks, and condiments. It's his family's glass sculpture of a potato chip bag and chips. The bag bears the name m s Pally Chip Company, established in the 1956, the year he and Myrna were married. Well, um, at the end of the day, when you look around at this room and in the other glass room, and all of the organizations you've yes. helped, you got to feel a little proud. I'm very, I'm very proud, I, and it, it's really nice to see that everybody can enjoy, can enjoy what we have enjoyed, and to see what can be done. Sheldon says he's going to continue to donate to all of South Florida's art organizations. As for Order Up, it's on through January 14th. I'll have the fries, please. I'm Lisa Petrillo, CBS News, Miami. It's that time of year again, and a seasonal South Florida staple is open for business, but it was a bittersweet day for the family of Nosberry Farms with the death of owner Rachel Nosgraf back in March after a brutal attack. As in years past, hundreds of cinnamon roll lovers stood in line for hours to get their hands on the sweet treats. CBS News Miami's Maribel Rodriguez has more. Get your taste buds ready. It's that time of the year for the gooey, mouth-watering, warm, freshly baked cinnamon rolls. The news so exciting, it kept these folks up all night. Delicious. Worth the wait? Yes, worth the wait since 12 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Yes, you heard right since Monday at noon. For Crescelli Pellis, the smell and the drive to Nosbury Farm and Homestead on opening day is a family tradition. I've been doing it for almost 40 years. Almost 40 years. So it started with my dad uh, when I was 10, and he, he, he would bring me here, and that's when I would be first in line with him. And this year, it was not about to change. Again, she was first in line, but now with her own daughter. Behind them, and hours later, from Chopper 4, you can see the amount of cinnamon lovers anxiously waiting to get their hands on the first batch of the season. And after hours of waiting, the doors finally opened. Inside, busy bodies hard at work making dozens and dozens of the famous rolls that year after year keep cinnamon roll lovers coming back to the South Florida landmark. Also, I want a large key um, lime shake. But for many, it's not just about the rolls. What began as a strawberry farm has grown into a South Florida staple, also known for their breads, pies, shakes, and of course, strawberries. Oh, they're so good. Now, they open Monday through Friday from 8 to 5.30 p.m. They close on Thanksgiving, Christmas, the day after Christmas, and New Year's Day. And remember, they only take cash. Maribel Rodriguez, CBS News, Miami. Worth the trip and worth the cost, too. Thanks for joining us this half hour on Headliners. As always, keep it right here to CBS News Miami for up-to-the-minute breaking news and weather 24 hours a day. Make it a great one.